Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the part four of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, as known as ICU Link. I am Sung Hun Lee from ICU, and this event is co organized with uh, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mizuta. Today, we have uh, two exciting talks by uh, uh, Professor Benjamin Bruning at University of Delaware and um, Professor Shin Fukuda at University of Hawaii. So let me first introduce the uh, speaker who uh, <coughs> is talking first. Uh, Benjamin Bruning is a professor of linguistic at the University of Delaware. His main research focuses on syntax and its interaction with morphology and semantics. He's worked on uh, various syntactic constructions, including ditransitives, anaphores, or WH scope, as well as uh, uh, issues related to sentence processing. Uh, he has worked on uh, Algonquian languages such as uh, Passamakoti Maliset and uh, Mi'kmaq, as well as uh, some Semitic languages. Uh, his work has appeared in Natural Language and Linguistic Theory, Syntax, Glossa, Linguistic Inquiry, and Language, among others. It's very good to have you here, uh, since we also have a lot of connection between ICU and <laughs> University of Delaware, as we found out this morning. And uh, today, Benjamin uh, will talk about spelling out the numeration, part one. Selection by itself accounts for synthetic periphrastic alternations. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, uh, we can hear you. You can speak a little bit louder. If, uh, if uh, sure, I can move closer to the computer too. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that working? Yes, we see it okay. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. It's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, oops. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, an ongoing research project. Um, this is just part one. Um, sorry, I need to move things around on my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a larger research project. This is just part one of this research project. Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to involve the numeration, um, and I'm going to be focusing on one particular aspect of it. Um, and trying to use it to explain synthetic periphrastic alternations like English do support. Okay, so um, so first of all, uh, what is the numeration? Well, the numeration is something that was introduced by Chomsky um, in chapter four of the minimalist program. Um, and the idea was the numeration is a set of elements um, that are drawn from the lexicon and put into this numeration. And the syntactic derivation draws from the numeration to build a syntactic structure. Um, and the idea is it doesn't access the lexicon directly, it can only take things from the numeration. Now, the original motivation for the numeration was to provide a comparison set for calculations of economy. The idea was that um, you compared what the derivation could have done with the same numeration. Um, now, subsequent work has maintained the numeration in some form. Uh, for instance, um, Chomsky 2000 has uh, subnumerations for each phase, um, which he calls the lexical array. Um, and many, uh, many works have sort of maintained this, but its importance has diminished. Most approaches to economy use local calculations of economy rather than global ones. And it's not clear that the numeration is actually doing any work in these cases. Okay, so I what I want to do in this larger research project is explore whether the concept of enumeration can actually be useful um, and see whether it can help us to explain syntactic phenomena. Um, so the idea is if syntax includes enumeration, then we should explore what constraints might hold of it, and we should explore the process that selects items from the lexicon for the enumeration and the process that selects items from the enumeration to then use in the derivation and put together in the syntax. Okay, so the idea is that properties of the numeration and these two input output processes might help to explain some syntactic phenomena, at least that's the hope. So what I'm going to do in this part, in part one, is start with the process that selects items from the lexicon and puts them in the numeration um, and see what mileage we can get out of that. So I'm going to look at two empirical domains. Uh, so one is what's been called the overflow pattern of auxiliaries. Um, this is uh, Bjorkman's term. She describes this in several different languages. I'm going to talk about Kinande, which is an African language. Um, and then I'll also talk about do support in English. And what we're going to see in both of these cases, um, and some others as well, is that there's a generalization where the presence of one thing 
always requires the presence of another thing. Um, so for instance, every head of a certain type has to have an inflectional morphing, so an agreement morphing. Um, or in the domain of verbal morphology, many languages require one verb for every inflectional head. So if you have more than one inflectional head, you're going to have to have more than one verb. Um, that's what the overflow pattern is. Um, so what I'm going to propose is that um, we have selectional requirements uh, where one thing selects another thing, and that drives the selection of items for the numeration. Um, so in the case of, say, do support, something will select an auxiliary and force you to have an auxiliary in the numeration itself. Um, and then there's no need for a last resort insertion mechanism uh, like do insertion as in traditional accounts. Okay, so let me start with some background and the conception of the numeration I have in mind. Um, so here are a couple of assumptions. So first, there is a numeration. Uh, the second assumption is that the derivation of a sentence is divided into smaller chunks, um, which I'll call phases. And each phase has its own numeration. For the purposes of this talk, I'm really going to be talking about CPs. Um, so each CP is its own phase. And I'm really only going to be talking about main clauses too, so this doesn't actually matter that much. Um, there is just going to be one numeration for each CP. Uh, I should say I am going to use the term numeration and not the term lexical array, which Chomsky uses. Um, for no good reason, really. Uh, I just like the term numeration. Okay, so what is the numeration? Well, it's a memory buffer. Uh, the idea is you, uh, you select a set of elements from the lexicon, you place them in this memory buffer, uh, which we'll call the numeration. The syntax then draws from this memory buffer to build a structure, and it's limited to drawing from the numeration. It can't access the lexicon once the derivation begins. Uh, so the numeration uh, limits the syntactic derivation that's your set of things that you can work with and nothing else. Um, now, the syntax does take things out of the numeration and puts them together. And it doesn't do this in the numeration. So there has to be a workspace in addition to the numeration. And I will just call that the workspace, uh, for lack of a better term. So here's the model in one that I'm assuming. So we have uh, the lexicon, which includes everything you might think is in a lexicon. Um, for purposes here, it doesn't really matter what's in a lexicon. There's going to be nouns, verbs, possibly features, um, ag agreement morphemes, inflectional morphemes, and so on. OK, then you're going to select things and put them in enumeration. And then you're going to select things from the numeration and put them together in the workspace. So this is how this index works. Um, now, to get from the lexicon to the numeration, there has to be a selection procedure, which I will abbreviate L2N for lexicon to numeration selection procedure. And then to get from the numeration to the workspace, there has to be a selection procedure again, which I will abbreviate N2W for enumeration to workspace uh, selection procedure. So in this talk, I'm mostly going to be talking about the selection of things from the lexicon into the numeration. So I'll be talking about L2N, the lexicon to numeration selection procedure. OK, so let me turn to the empirical domain, uh, which is synthetic periphrastic alternations. Um, here's an example of English do support. So in a simple matrix declarative, um, you don't have do support. She studies too much. Instead, the tense and agreement, the um, zzz part here, indicating a third person singular present tense, uh, just goes on the main verb. Um, so this is a synthetic attachment of the inflection to the main verb. Um, but in 2B, when you have um, a question, a yes, no question, um, an auxiliary suddenly appears to host the inflectional morpheme zzz again, and you get, does she study too much, while the main verb is uninflected. So this is a periphrastic construction where the uh, tense and agreement is separated from the main verb. It's on a different word. Um, so a, an ongoing question in syntax has always been, how do we account for these synthetic periphrastic alternations? Um, now, the typical analysis of English do support is that it's a last resort operation. So this follows Chomsky 1957. Um, the idea is that in a simple declarative, there's no reason to do do support. So you can't do it. It's not allowed. It's a last resort mechanism. You only do it when you have to. Um, but so if some constraint is violated, and typically people say what's, what's wrong is you've separated tense and the main verb so that they can't combine. So back here in the question, the uh, tense and agreement gets separated from the main verb through inversion. Um, and so you have to insert the verb do to support uh, the tense and agreement inflection. OK, so the, the repair operation is insertion of a semantically contentless item, um, in this case, the auxiliary do. 
Um, now this requires uh, what's called a syn categorimatic insertion mechanism. Um, so this requires that the syntax be able to insert items in the course of the derivation, even, even items that weren't present in the numeration from the beginning. Um, now this kind of violates the whole idea of the numeration. The idea behind the numeration is that the syntax can't access the lexicon directly. It can only work with what was provided to it in the numeration. Um, and the idea there is you're reducing computational complexity. You don't have to search through the entire lexicon every time you want to merge something. Instead, you just work with the smaller set of things in the numeration. So if you have a, an operation like do insertion, this sort of goes against the entire spirit of the numeration. It's conceptually incompatible with it. It also opens the door to massive overgeneration. Um, if the syntax is capable of inserting things that weren't in the input it was given, then it should be able to generate any structure from almost any input because you can just insert anything you want. Um, now, one could try to restrict this, for instance, limit uh, these insertion rules to semantically contentless items like English do or expletives. Even this gets problematic, though. Um, so Chomsky 2000 discusses cases like in three, um, where it's uh, what determines whether the highest NP in a clause moves to spec TP has to depend on whether there's an expletive in the numeration. Um, so this requires that expletives be present in the numeration and that you can't insert them if they weren't in the numeration. Um, so the idea in three is um, if there is an expletive, you have to leave uh, a book down low in 3A um, and you can't then move it into this intermediate position in 3B. Okay, but in 3C, if there is no expletive, then presumably you do move it into this intermediate position and then move it on to the matrix spec TP. Um, so in 3A versus B, uh, if there is an expletive, you have to insert it first and then move it in 3A. Um, but this requires you to know whether or not there is an expletive in the numeration, and which then requires that there could not be a rule that inserts expletives that are not present in the numeration. And so we just don't want to have rules that insert things that aren't present in the numeration. Um, so I'm going to assume that last resort insertion operations don't exist. There is no such thing. And the syntax is incapable of inserting anything that is not present in the numeration. Um, so then the numeration for an English yes, no question say has to include do in the numeration. And then the question is going to be, how can we ensure that that's the case and that we get uh, the auxiliary do in exactly the right numerations where it needs to appear and not where it doesn't. Okay, so the idea is going to be that selection is what determines this. Um, so the idea is that um, information about items that we select for the numeration can be used to select other items for the numeration. Okay, so in the English do support case, um, if we select a complementizer that has the feature that triggers head movement to C, then there's some constraint that says that the numeration also has to have an element of category auxiliary verb in it. Um, and what's going to ensure that? Well, the suggestion is going to be it's just selection, which we independently need. Okay, so um, let me try to independently motivate some of the um, uh, concepts I'm gonna be using and the tools. Uh, I'm gonna start by talking about nominal concord uh, and I'll illustrate with Bulgarian. Um, so here are a couple of examples from Bulgarian in four. So the big interesting book and the very, or the very nice books. Um, the thing to notice about Bulgarian is that every noun has to have this little ending on it. So here, kniga, is a feminine singular nominative case, and it has this a ending. Um, in 4b, it's instead plural and nominative case of so knigi, so the, um, the vowel ending changes. But then the thing to notice is that the endings change on all the other things inside the noun phrase too. So interesting ends in a in 4a, and big ends in a in 4a, but in 4b, nice ends in e, just like knigi. Okay, so, uh, what we're finding here is nominal concord. Every, every item of a certain type has to have an agreement morpheme that agrees with the noun. Um, one thing to notice is that adverbs like very don't have this. So it's only certain things in the noun phrase. So adjectives in this case, uh, big, interesting, nice. Um, in the next couple of examples, it's also possessive pronouns like my. Um, so we have moya and chubava, kniga. So they all end in a. Um, and then we have knigi, then we have trite, novi, knigi. So they all end in e. Okay, so this is a pretty standard nominal concord, shows up in lots of languages. 
Um, but the thing to notice is that every single head of a certain type has to have one of these agreement morphemes. Um, and I'm going to assume that the syntax is what puts together all complex items. Um, so we need the syntax to take a noun like knig and put the ending on it. So the syntax is what puts the noun and the agreement morpheme together. Same with the adjective. Um, the syntax takes an adjective and an agreement morpheme and it puts them together. Um, so this then means that the numeration is going to have to have an agreement head if it includes a noun. Um, it's going to have to have another agreement head if it includes an adjective. And in fact, the numeration is going to have to include exactly one agreement head for each head of the relevant type that it includes. Um, so back in these examples, uh, for the possessive pronoun and the adjective, we're going to need an aggerhead. And for a noun, we're going to need another aggerhead. Um, so notice that this is kind of one-to-one -one matching. For each head of the relevant type, we also need one agreement morphing. OK, so here's, um, here's a suggested numeration for exactly this uh, example, the big interesting book. So Goliam is big, Interesna is interesting, and Kniga is book. So the numeration has to include exactly the items in A through G. So we need uh, the adjective big, and then it requires an agreement morpheme. We also have the definite article, which I won't be talking about here. Um, it raises its own set of interesting issues. Um, but then we have another adjective, interesting, and that's going to require another agreement morpheme. So we need another agreement morpheme. And then we have the head noun, knig, which is a noun, and that requires another agreement morpheme. So we need a third agreement morpheme. So the only numeration that will lead to a convergent derivation is going to have to have three agreement morphemes, one for each head of the relevant type. OK, so how is this going to work? Um, well, I'll say that all and only the relevant items in Bulgarian, so adjectives, nouns, possessive pronouns, uh, I forgot what else. Um, we'll just say those have the feature plus n, for lack of a better term. Uh, numerals, that's the other thing. So they all have the feature plus n. Adverbs don't have the feature plus n. So then we need something that will have the effect of eight, which says that every time the lexicon to numeration selection procedure selects a plus n element from the lexicon and moves it to the numeration, it's then also going to have to select an agreement head as the next item to move from the lexicon to the numeration. So something is going to ensure this one-to-one -one matching. Each time you take a plus n head and put it in the numeration, you're also going to have to take along an agreement head. OK. so. Um, uh, so this is just a description here of what's going to happen in eight. Um, now I'm going to try to say what, what formally it is that motivates this. Okay, and uh, I will suggest that it operates just purely on the basis of selection. Okay, so let's say uh, you want to build a CP um, and you need to select items from the lexicon for enumeration in order to build a CP. Well, where are you going to start from? Um, one obvious place to start would be with the head C, since it's the head of the phase. Um, and then the obvious way to proceed from there is on the basis of selection. So if C selects T, then the next item you select will be T. And then you can just keep doing this. T will select something. So you will then select that for the numeration. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is that we have something like 9. So each time the lexicon to numeration selection procedure, L2N, selects an element x with a selectional feature um, s, y. So I'll, I'll borrow this from uh, my 2013 paper where selectional features are indicated with this s. Um, and then y is the category it selects. So each time an element x with a selectional feature s, y is selected and moved from the lexicon to the numeration, then L2n has to select an element of category y from the lexicon and move it to the numeration too. OK, so that's the idea. When you select one thing, if, it's, if it uh, has a selectional feature, you then select what it selects. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate that I'm going to be using the word select a lot in two different senses. So in one sense, we're going to select items from the lexicon and move them to the enumeration. But we're going to be doing this on the basis of selection, which is uh, properties of lexical items. OK, so I hope that's not going to be too confusing. OK. Um, so hopefully it makes conceptual sense that we would operate this way. Um, so in the clausal domain, it is the, the higher functional heads that determine the properties of the clause. Um, so in a CP, it's the head C that determines the properties of the clause. And C also then determines what items are necessary lower down. 
um, what items are necessary in the clause below C. Um, so then it makes sense that you would start with the highest functional head and work downward. That will make L2N's task easier. It will just follow the selectional requirements of the items as it chooses them. Um, and uh, this corresponds mostly to top-down structure building, although we aren't building structure at this point. We're just selecting items from the lexicon for the numeration. Um, but the selection will work in a basically a top-down fashion. So I'm going to assume that this is in fact the case. Um, and in other work, I, I argue that the syntactic derivation is actually put together in this way as well, um, but that won't be important here. Okay, so the idea is that the selection of items from the lexicon for the numeration proceeds on the basis of selectional requirements of the items that we previously chose. So when you choose one thing, you then choose the next thing based on what it selects. Okay, so how are we gonna account for Bulgarian nominal concord? Um, well, all we need is a statement like that in 10. In Bulgarian, all plus N elements have the selectional feature uh, S agar. They select an agar head. Um, so that's gonna then have the result uh, because of nine, which I repeat here, that uh, whenever a plus N element is selected from the lexicon and moved to the numeration, then an agreement head must be two um, because we will then, you're, you're forced by nine to select something um, that that head selects. Okay, um, I hope that's clear. Can people still hear me? My screen seems to have frozen. Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Okay. But the slides are not advancing, I assume. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, let me exit full screen mode and see what happens. Well, Zoom is working, but uh, nothing else seems to be. Uh, Sorry, let me uh, unplug my external monitor. I can force you to from sharing the screen. Should I try to do that? Yeah, I can't even, I don't even have a cursor now. So, so okay, now, now I have my cursor back. All right, um, let me try this again then. Maybe I don't, I can't use my external monitor. Sharing the screen is not working either. Uh, mm, let me check your co-host status. Oh, okay, now it's working. Oh, okay, good. Yes, we can see, yeah. Okay. Okay, is it a good size? Yes, that, I think this is fine, yeah. Okay, all right, I think it's working now. Uh, yep. Okay, I think this is where I was. Yes. Uh, okay, so, um, so back to Bulgarian nominal concord. Um, we just need to say that all plus n elements have the selectional feature S agar. Um, so then that's gonna require that every time you select um, a plus n element from the lexicon and move it into the numeration. You then have to select an agreement head and move it into the numeration as well. Um, now, one alternative that I will reject is the idea of a hierarchy of projections. Um, so you could operate on the basis of a universal hierarchy. Um, so this is a, an idea that is often adopted. Um, so the idea is that there is a, either a universal or mostly universal hierarchy of projections with some language particular variations maybe. Um, so this is pretty common in cartographic approaches, but it's also adopted in um, many different uh, approaches. It's spelled out most clearly in Azure 2010. So I'm gonna focus on that. Um, so here's what Azure proposes for English. So he says there is a hierarchy of projections in 11a for clauses. Um, it starts with the verb and then little v and then passive, progressive, perfective, modal, negation, T, finite, C. 
Um, the numbers here are just indicating the level on the hierarchy. So verb is the lowest, C is the highest. Inside the nominal domain in 11b, n is the lowest. Um, Q, I think is quantifier, is the highest. Okay, so then Adger proposes that there are two different modes of merge. There is select merge, um, where a category selects a feature, say C, and this feature is checked off by merging it with a category that has that feature. So if a verb selects a C, you satisfy that by merging a CP. But then there's also a hierarchy of projection merge um, where you just combine two things. There's no selectional relation between them, no feature checking. That's allowed so long as the hierarchy of projections is respected. So here are a couple of examples. So you can combine a verb with T directly because the verb is lowest and T is number seven, and that's fine. It respects the hierarchy of projections. Um, you can combine the verb and passive in T in that order. Uh, so one is lower than three and three is lower than seven. Or the runner was being tripped. You have uh, verb is one, then we have passive is three, then progressive is four, and then tense is seven. So those all respect the hierarchy of projections. A couple of examples that don't are like those in 13. Um, so if we put things in the wrong order, so we go from verb to perfect, which is five, and then we try to go to progressive, that's four. We violated the hierarchy of projections. We went one, five, four, um, which is the wrong numerical order. Um, so the alternative for selecting for the numeration would be we start with something high on the hierarchy and proceed downward, or the opposite, we start with something low and proceed upward. So this would be a way that uh, the selection procedure could work. Um, unfortunately, hierarchy of projection merge is too permissive. Um, so in some other work, I pointed out it incorrectly permits C to merge directly with V, for instance, but there's no language that I know of where C can do that. So you have to have functional categories in between, like aspect or modal or T or something. Um, so then the hierarchy of projection merge is not sufficient. You need some sort of selectional feature in addition to say C always requires something like T. Um, and uh, select merge is actually sufficient as well. We don't need hierarchy of projection merge. Um, all we need is disjunctive selection, which is independently necessary. So there are plenty of verbs like forget, say, that select for either a CP or an NP, but not both simultaneously. And they don't select for other categories. So 14 shows that um, forgets going to select an NP, like she forgot her didgeridoo. Um, we can forget. Uh, select a CP, she forgot that her didgeridoo needed tuning, um, but you can't have an NP and a CP at the same time as in 14C. And D and E just show us that forget doesn't select other categories. It doesn't uh, select adjectives or verbs. Um, so we need to allow a verb, uh, a verb like forget to select either an NP or a CP, but not both simultaneously. Um, so in featural terms, what we can say is that forget has the feature S and then a set of a noun and a C. And this feature will then be satisfied by merging one member of the set and not both. You can only merge one. Um, so here's a way to capture the effects of hierarchy of projection merge with disjunctive selection. Um, so I just took uh, Adger's passive, progressive, perfect, mode, neg, TC, and so on, um, and gave them sets. So passive only selects a verb, but progressive selects either a verb or passive, and so on, up to T, which can select any of a verb, passive, progressive, perfect, mode, uh, neg. Um, C only selects T, so it's very selective. Um, and then we account for the exact same examples. T can select V, or T can select passive, and passive can select V. The ones that were ruled out, like the runner was having tripped, um, is also ruled out because progressive does not select perfect back here. Um, so 16B. Progressive selects only uh, V or passive. It doesn't so select perfect. Okay. Uh, so the select merge does all the work of the hierarchy projection merge. Uh, we need disjunctive selection anyway for verbs like forget. And that seems to be um, the, just how most verbs work. Um, hierarchy of projection verb over generates. Um, and since we don't need it, why would we have two different modes of merge when one will do? Um, also, uh, select merge can account for Bulgarian nominal concord. So we can say every plus n has selects an agreement morphing, um, but that doesn't really follow from an extrinsic hierarchy. 
Um, if there is a hierarchy in the nominal domain, it's between things like adjectives and nouns and quantifiers and so on, and not between an adjective and an agreement morpheme or a noun and an agreement morpheme. So and a hierarchy just has nothing to say about those. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that um, everything works on the basis of selection. Uh, so here's how numerations will work. For a CP phase, we start by selecting a C from the lexicon and moving it to the numeration. Um, I'm gonna leave aside NP phases. I won't worry about them here. Um, and then we had nine already. Each time you select an element X with a selectional feature S, Y, you must then select an element Y from the lexicon and move it to the numeration. Uh, I think I'm getting short on time, so I will try to speed up and get to the um, empirical domains I want to talk about. So the first is the overflow pattern in Kinande. Um, so let me first explain what the overflow pattern is. Um, so in Kinande, you can mark tense on the main verb. So here's an example in 20. Uh, so we have past. Um, this is actually past three. There are four different distances of past tense. It doesn't matter here um, really what they are. It's a tense category. Um, past three is a recent past, I guess. You can also mark aspect on the main verb in Kinande. So here it's progressive. But what Kinande cannot do is mark both tense and aspect on the verb at the same time. Instead, you have to use an auxiliary. So if you want to have both past three and progressive, you need this B verb, which is bia, I guess. Um, and then you have the main verb. So uh, one category, progressive, goes on the main verb, and the other, past, goes on the auxiliary verb. Um, so Bjorkman calls this an overflow pattern. She says there are too many inflectional affixes for a single verb, so you have to insert an additional one. Um, and she describes this in Arabic and Latin, and uh, Petrajko describes one in Ndebele as well. So uh, this kind of pattern appears in various different languages. Um, so Bjorkman proposes a last resort analysis of this. Uh, in her analysis, both tense and aspect are in full heads. Um, and what happens is when you have two, one gets in the way of the other one. So they both need to agree with the verb, but when one is in the way of the higher one, that can not happen. They also both need to be realized on the verb, but when one is in the way of the other one, you can't do that. Um, so this forces insertion of a default verb. And Bjorkman argues that that is the verb be cross-linguistically. Um, so there's a last resort insertion rule sticking in the verb B. Um, now I'm going to pursue a different analysis for the reasons I gave before. We don't want last resort insertion rules. Uh, I'm going to suggest that Kinande is behaving very much like Bulgarian. There seems to be a requirement of one-to-one -one matching between inflectional heads, like aspect and T, and verbal heads. Um, and this is a generalization that various people have pointed out. So um, Bjorkman captures it in one way, Petrajko's dissertation, uh, captures it in a different way. Um, but the idea is that if there are two infill heads, then there must be two verbal heads as well. Um, so something is going to have to ensure that in Kinande, each time you take an infill head and put it in the numeration, then you also have to put a head of category V into the numeration. Um, so since I'm proposing that everything operates on the basis of selection, I'm going to state this in terms of selection and say that in Kinande, all inflectional heads have the feature SV. Um, and uh, we want to state this on as a requirement on the inflectional heads, not the verbal heads. Um, so auxiliary verbs are, are not always forced to appear in certain environments. Um, so there are cases where inflectional heads seems to be absent, like small clauses. Um, in some languages, bare verb stems can appear in certain environments. So it doesn't look like it's the verbal heads that are requiring the inflectional heads. It's the other way around. The inflectional heads are requiring the verbal heads. And that seems to be in keeping with selection, which uh, works downward generally in the causal domain. OK, so uh, let's get to an analysis. Um, so here's past tense by itself. I'm going to assume a very simple structure, as in 25. Um, so there's a CP phase. I'll assume there's a null C. Um, I'm going to just say that. Uh, everything like tense and aspect is a subcategory of inflection. So I'll call this infill colon T to be mean it's a, a tense subcategory of inflection. Um, notice there's agreement here as well. Uh, I'll assume that's an agger head adjoined to the infill head. Uh, I'm going to assume that the verb will move and adjoin to the infill head as well, which will then give us the word order in 24. Um, and there seems to be a null subject as well, which I'll notate pro. 
So that's the we. There doesn't seem to be an object based on the translation. Uh, so I'll assume there isn't. And this is something like um, uh, an implicit object. But um, if there is a null object, then we can just stick in a null object. OK, so the initial step is we start with C. That's how all things, uh, all phases work. Uh, we're going to start selecting things from the lexicon, put them in the numeration. Uh, so we start with C. Uh, here's the null C. I'm going to assume it selects something of category info. Um, so then following uh, the rule, we then have to take something of category info out of the lexicon and put it into the numeration. So in this case, we will take this past morpheme. So it's an inflectional morpheme of category T, which has, itself has a selectional feature selecting a verb. So then we will have to take a V. So in this case, we'll take the verb hit and move that into the numeration. Now, there is another requirement, uh, we, uh, which is that there be an agreement morpheme. So Kinande requires that there be an agar head for every info head. Um, this is just like Bulgarian requiring an agar head for every plus n head. Um, so what we'll say is that is in 29, all info heads have the feature s agar. So we have to revise step one. So when we take the uh, past tense morpheme and put it into the numeration, this actually has both a verbal selectional feature and an agar selectional feature. Um, so now following the rule, we have to take a verb and an agar and move them into the numeration. So we have to revise step two and add a step three. So in step two, we add a verb. And in step three, we add an agreement morpheme. Um, now th these can be simultaneous. Um, or they can occur in sequence, and the order doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what has to happen, though, is that the selection procedure takes both a verb and an agar morpheme and puts them in the numeration. OK, uh, I'm going to assume that agar heads have no form in the numeration. Their forms determined contextually in the syntax. Um, we need some sort of agreement mechanism where the agar head will agree with the subject of the verb and will take its form based on the features it acquires. Um, how this works isn't that important. I think any theory of agreement will, will work. Um, so I'm not going to address that at all. Now, the verb also selects a subject. Um, for purposes here, I'm just going to assume it, we can select a pronoun. Now, that itself is its own phase. It's a full NP. Um, so that probably has its own numeration. Um, but since it's a simple pronoun in the cases we're talking about, I'm just going to ignore that. And uh, we'll just select a pronoun. So this case, in this one, it's a category noun, and it has features first person plural. OK, so now the numeration is complete. Um, we've selected everything that we needed for the, to satisfy the selectional features. Um, there's one inflectional morpheme T, and one V, and one agar, exactly as required. Um, now, the syntax will have to build a structure in the workspace. Um, uh, that will be this output mechanism uh, the numeration to workspace selection procedure. Um, we'll move things from the numeration to the workspace and put them together. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that here. Uh, the important part here is that no auxiliary verb is required because the main verb was sufficient to satisfy the requirement of one-to-one -one matching between inflectional heads and verbs. And I stated that as a selectional requirement. Now, notice that if we had selected an auxiliary verb incorrectly, that would then require another element of category info because uh, uh, we'll, we'll see that auxiliary verbs generally have a selectional feature for something else of category info. Um, so the, this derivation would crash or it would mean something else because we need more inflectional morphemes. Okay, so um, if we just have past tense, the only thing you can have is a main verb. Um, aspect by itself, we're working basically the same way. I assume the structure is very similar. The verb moves up to here to the aspect morpheme. Um, we have an agar morpheme on aspect. Um, so the numeration works the exact same way. We select a C. That has a selectional feature for an infomorpheme. So the next thing we have to do is select an infomorpheme. Here is the aspect one. Now that selects a verb and an agreement morpheme. So we then have to take one of each of those and put them in the numeration. So that's what we do in the next steps. So we take a main verb and an agreement morpheme. And again, if we were to select an auxiliary verb incorrectly, that would then select an inflectional morpheme, and we'd end up with a very different derivation. 
Um, now the verb selects a subject. So again, we select a pronoun, a null pronoun. Um, now the numeration is complete. Again, no auxiliary is required. Okay, but now we come to the more interesting case where we have the overflow pattern, where we have T and aspect together. Um, so I'm gonna assume that it has a structure as in 42. So where there's an auxiliary verb and there's an inflectional morpheme with an agromorpheme above that and an inflectional morpheme with an agromorpheme below that above the main verb, which selects a subject. And I'm gonna assume the auxiliary verb moves to the higher info while the main verb moves to the lower info. Um, this, this also has this linker element. Um, I don't really know what that is. Um, I have no information about it, so I'm gonna ignore it. Um, I, I assume we could just add it into this structure once we understand its properties. Okay, so we start with C again. So we select a null C, it selects an info element. So the next thing we have to do is select one of those. Um, suppose we just take the aspect one. Now this is actually the lower one down here, um, but that's okay. We'll see it, it doesn't really matter. We just select uh, an aspect morpheme. Now that selects a verb and an agromorpheme. So we need to select one of each of those. Um, so suppose we selected the main verb along with an agromorphine. Um, now the only thing that we're selecting is a noun. So we'd select the pronoun and then the derivation would end. We'd have selected everything for the numeration. So this could therefore never be the numeration for a derivation that includes both tense and aspect. So the only way we could actually get that to work is to select something that can select an infomorphine. And I'm gonna su suggest that what that is, is an auxiliary verb. So let's go back and revise. So instead of selecting the main verb, we select an auxiliary verb. And the defining property of an auxiliary verb is that it selects something in category info. Um, so then we're gonna need one of those. We can then select T. So that's tense here, which then selects another verb and another agromorpheme. So we'll need one of each of those. Um, so in this case, we'll choose the main verb and another agromorphine. Um, so we're operating again, just on the basis of selection. Um, then the only thing that's left is we need a noun. Um, so we do that, we add a pronoun and this numeration is now complete and we can put the derivation together in the workspace um, following whatever, um, uh, whatever procedures that uses. And something is then gonna to have to ensure that tense is higher than aspect. Um, uh, one way that would work is just on the basis of selection again, um, using that kind of dis disjunctive selection that I showed before. Um, okay, so this der derives the overflow pattern. Um, the requirement of one-to-one -one matching is exactly like the requirement of one-to-one -one matching in Bulgarian nominal concord. Um, and the proposal here is we model them via selection. Each time you select something with a selectional feature, you then have to select something of the selected category. Um, I'm gonna skip over this and go to English do support. Um, say how we can account for that. So English do support is said to occur in the NICE contexts, uh, N-I-C-E, where this stands for negation, inversion, uh, contrast, and ellipsis. Um, there's, it also happens in VP fronting, as in they said that she would study too much and study too much she does. Um, I'll lump that in with ellipsis as a case where the verb isn't occurring where it's supposed to. Um, I already discussed the typical last resort analysis, so I'll go back over that. Um, um, but there, there, people have given reasons to reject the last resort analysis besides the conceptual one that I gave before. Um, so one is uh, in an in a earlier paper of mine, I argued that there are grammatical phenomena in English that are sensitive to the exact same contexts, even when no, no do support applies, like in non-finite clauses. Um, so that, uh, I concluded this shows there has to be a positive specification that all these contexts have in common, um, not just that tense is being separated from the verb. Um, so following Baker 1991, I proposed that there's a special purpose feature that they all have in common. Um, and then context with a special purpose feature require an auxiliary verb. Um, Bjorkman gives a different argument. She says that the distribution of do support cross-linguistically is unexpected if it applies as a last resort operation to support a stranded T. 
So I'm going to uh, assume that these arguments are correct. Do support is not a last resort phenomenon. We want some other analysis of it. So I'll adopt the special purpose analysis and say that there is a feature SP that they all have in common. Okay, so here's a simple declarative with no do support. She dances. Here's the structure I'm going to assume. Um, there's a C head, a T head. And I'm going to assume that in English, every verb requires an agreement morpheme. And this agreement morpheme will agree with the functional head above the verb. So in this case, T. So this agreement morpheme will agree with T and acquire its um, tense value, which is present. And T also agrees with the subject. So uh, the subject's features will also get transmitted to the agar head. Okay, so um, here's a statement about English in 55. All elements of category v, v have the feature S agar. Okay. Uh, I'm going to modify the selectional features that we had before. So I'm going to suggest that passive, progressive, perfect, modal, these are all subcategories of auxiliary verbs. Auxiliary verbs and main verbs are subcategories of a larger category verb. Um, I'm going to say there are two different T heads in English. So there's a plain T, which just has the feature S, V. It's satisfied with anything of category V. But a T that has the SP feature is much more selective. It selects either negation or an auxiliary verb, and that's it. And then neg has the feature select auxiliary verb. Um, so any SPT will require an auxiliary verb or negation, and negation will always require an auxiliary verb as well. OK, so let's run through a simple declarative. We start with C. C selects a T, so we then need a T. T selects a V. Um, this clause doesn't have any semantically contentful auxiliary verbs, so we choose a main verb, like dance. It requires an agreement morpheme and a noun, so we have to choose one of each of those. So we take an agreement morpheme and a noun, in this case, a pronoun. The enumeration is complete. No auxiliary verb is required. So let's go to a negative declarative now, like she does not dance. I'll assume it has the structure here. Um, there is an auxiliary verb. This will move across negation to give she does not dance. Um, I'm, uh, again, every verb requires an, an agreement morpheme. Uh, the one on do agrees with T. The one on dance agrees with the auxiliary verb do. And uh, uh, do acts like the modals in that the agreement morpheme um, it, that agrees with it is always null. So we start with C, C selects a T. Um, if we want a negation, then what we're gonna have to do is select the T with a special purpose feature um, because the other T doesn't select negation. So, so we select that T with a special purpose feature, which then has the selectional feature, the set, neg, and auxiliary verb. So we then have to choose one of those, either neg or auxiliary verb. In this case, we choose negation. That then selects an auxiliary verb. Um, so if we don't have any semantically contentful auxiliary verbs, then um, the lexicon denumeration selection procedure has to select the semantically contentless do. So that's what we'll do. We'll put do in the numeration. Um, that then selects a main verb um, or an agreement morphing. Sorry, and an agreement morphing. So then we have to put an agreement morpheme and a main verb in the numeration. Um, and then the, the main verb will require another agreement morpheme and a noun. So we put one of those, one of each of those in the numeration, and then this is complete. Okay, so you can see that this uh, then derives do support. Um, I won't go through all the other contents or other examples, but here's an example with a contentful auxiliary verb. So you, you might want to choose one of those, like with a modal should, um, and if you do, selectional requirements will be satisfied. Um, so I'll I'll skip over those. Um, in inversion, we can just say that the C head selects uh, the T that has the SP feature, and then we'll have to have an auxiliary verb as well. Um, similarly for VRM focus, VP fronting, and so on. Um, I think I'm way over time, so um, I will skip over a lot of this. Um, so there is, a, a, we, the same account can be given for um, do support in other languages. Uh, there are other languages that have something like do support, but the contexts are slightly different. Um, so let me just sum up. 
so most research on syntax that has used enumeration has never bothered to spell out exactly how it works. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do is um, explore exactly how it works and how we select items from the lexicon for the enumeration. Um, and the idea is that we can then um, use that to understand how synthetic paraphrastic alternations like do support and the overflow pattern of auxiliaries works. Um, I mentioned that there, there is this generalization showing up in lots of different languages where um, we require one-to-one -one matching between certain inflectional heads and certain other heads. Um, and the current account captures these requirements. Um, one last point is that I have used the numeration here, selection of items from the lexicon for the numeration. But for the things I'm talking about here, it's actually superfluous. We could have just gone straight from the lexicon to the, to the workspace, skipping the numeration, and the account would work just as well. Um, I haven't done that because in the, the larger research project where we're looking at the process that moves items from the numeration into the workspace, it is crucial there that there is a numeration and that the syntax can't access the lexicon directly. Um, so for that reason, I'm, I'm using the numeration here. Um, but I just wanted to point out that it's actually not crucial to account for the synthetic paraphrastic alternations. It's the selection mechanism itself that's crucial. Okay, um, I will end there uh, and I apologize for going over time. Um, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, let's uh, applaud. <laughs> and yeah, so thank you for the interesting talk. I was also excited to see Kinanda data <laughs> a little bit. Uh, uh, so uh, I sent a, in the chat window uh, uh, to send me your name and affiliation if you have any questions and or comments uh, on Benjamin's talk. Does anyone have any? I think they're still thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, Shin, thank you. Uh, Shin Hukuda from University of Hawaii. Uh, please unmute yourself and. Oh, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting talk and um, uh, because you briefly touched on uh, auxiliary verbs of different types, uh, semantically not contentful and contentful, that got me uh, think about uh, how uh, models would be handled in, in this kind of system. I was wondering because uh, in many languages, I think the same uh, same same items can be used to uh, um, express either epistemic or root modality, and oftentimes those differences are closely associated with the syntactic positions. And so I was wondering how those uh, differences among the same lexical items would be handled. Would it have to be selection? Therefore, we have multiple models with different uh, selection of properties in the lexicon, or are there other ways to handle, uh, I guess, items that have different uh, meaning and in, uh, different syntactic position associated with them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I have not given that a lot of thought. So uh, I mean, it is true that you do find this systematically across lots of languages where um, yeah, root and epistemic models are, are the same form. Um, and you also see good evidence that they occur in different positions. Um, I do not have anything uh, interesting to say about that at this point. Uh, I will think about it very carefully. Um, so it, yeah, it would be unfortunate if we just had to say that in so many different languages, there were homophonous lexical items. I mean, that would be very disappointing and non-explanatory. Um, so there has to be a better account. Unfortunately, I don't have one. Um, so if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. I don't have ideas, but I'll think about that too. But I'm, I'm interested in, in general, uh, this issue, like not only just uh, modal verbs, but also I think aspectual verbs could also be uh, something similar. So some people would say that some aspectual verbs can behave like control verbs versus raising verbs or uh, 
lexical versus functional. So that, that I guess it could be somewhat, not maybe large area, but a good portion of syntaxomatic interface has this issue. So I, I'm very much interested in how that would be accounted for in your system. Yeah, um, that is a very good question. And there are some interesting mismatches too between um, what looks like the selectional properties and the syntactic structure of certain auxiliaries and their actual semantics. So that there are cases where the order of two auxiliaries does not correspond to their semantic scope. Um, but there seems to be a strict syntactic selectional relation going only one way. Um, so uh, yeah, this raises a whole lot of interesting questions. Um, and I wish I had a, a, a satisfying analysis of it, but at this point I don't. Um, so I think we do have to recognize that there's a difference between syntactic selection and syntactic structure and semantic interpretation. Um, but what the best account of that is, I, I don't really know at this point. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, due to some time constraints, I think uh, we can continue any uh, uh, burning questions in the breakout room. Uh, so we will open a breakout room and uh, Benjamin will be there and uh, some other speakers. Anybody who wants to join the breakout room, please do so. You can ask questions. And uh, since it's 10.56, we will start uh, Shin's talk at 11.04. Six or eleven or seven, let's say, eleven or seven. Yeah, after a ten minute break. Yeah. So, see you in the breakout room, and let's stop the recording. Yeah.